Gig Gab, episode 352 for Monday, August 1st, 2022. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about, for, by, and about, by, about, and for working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Yeah, man. Another week. Here we are. Here we are. How's it going? <laughs> uh, it's going fine. I, um, I, had an, uh, I had weird symptoms last week, Paul, and uh, I... I Thought I, I had whatever my son had, which was definitively not COVID, and now I I found out on Saturday that in fact I had uh, COVID again all week. So, uh, you know, that's just a, I, I don't know checks the box I guess on the mm -hmm. reset, resetting the clock. I, I had I had like a scratchy throat and some headaches. It really wasn't much, but um, yeah. So the uh, the the part that I felt. Sort of the worst about, I mean, I definitely felt the worst about it was that on Friday night before I realized I had COVID, we went and saw Luke Bryan. So I knew it was a COVID fest going to a concert, any concert nowadays you go to, is, you know, especially if you're in the pit, it's COVID fest. I did not realize I was a participant in this until after the fact. So I feel a little bad about that, uh, of course. But um, but Luke, Luke Bryan, I, it was a fascinating show. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of his. I have nothing, you know, for or against him, really. Uh, I went because mm -hmm. my, my wife and my daughter are into it. And it's fascinating. Here's this guy, obviously megastar. Most of his songs are mid-tempo tunes. Like, th like they are the songs that for many bands would just be set killers. And mm -hmm. he here's Luke Bryan delivering the crap out of these things and like the crowd is in, you know, hanging on every word right there with him. And it's a hundred percent him. He is, we were in the pit, like, you know, maybe we wound up being about five or six people back from, from the edge of the stage and just watching him just like, he never stopped Keeping the energy going. And honestly, he, he reminded me a little bit of you because you're always focused on, you know, keeping like energy to the crowd, energy to the crowd. You got to do something. You can't ever ignore the fact that the crowd's there. And uh, and he was just constantly pouring energy out. And and obviously it works. I mean, you know, like I said, the guy's a huge star, successful tour. Did three night three sold out nights here in New Hampshire? Yeah, you know, like no, his his cred is 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 safe, right? Right. But it was just really fascinating. About halfway through the show, I realized, man, like all of these songs are the same tempo, and they're all like you know this just plodding along kind of thing. And it, his drummer was like locked in the pocket all night because it would be easy with a high energy mid tempo show to want to accelerate the tempos, you know, sort of naturally, but he Absolutely. never did. Yeah. He never did. Like the guy just stayed like real. This solid. is kind of like our conversation last week about how can you create grooves at less than 120 BP, BPM, right? It was, it was as though the universe delivered me an example <laughs> of exactly that. Yeah. It was fascinating. And when he finally did play, you know, what I'll call an up tempo number for him, that might've been 112 BPM, you know, it was like I, I said to my daughter, I'm like, hey, an up-tempo number. She says, yeah, finally, you know, because uh, you sort of get sick and tired of moving at the same pace. You know, you kind of want to move a little, little differently. And we were standing in the pit all night. So, you know, um, so there was that. But, yeah, super entertaining. It was it was fascinating. There was one point where uh, we saw some security guards uh, near us, like, shining their lights into the crowd. There was clearly something going on. And one of the road crew came over and like to the edge of the stage and looked to see what was going on. And then he made this sign to Luke Bryan with, with his two arms crossed in front of him. And Luke made the sign to the band and the band stopped playing instantly. Oh yeah. And it was like, what? 
And he grabbed the mic and he said, hey, uh, we're going to we're going to take a break. We're going to pause here not not take a break. We're going to pause here while we make sure somebody gets the attention they need, you know, and, and it, the, the weird part was it went on for a little bit longer than it should have. You know, it was probably close to five minutes of dead air. And that's a dangerous thing in the middle of a, you know, what effectively is a rock concert. I know it's a country concert, but it's, you know, it's basically a rock concert. Um, it, you know, the, the crowd needs something to focus on and there was nothing. And it was like, okay, this is going to so get. So there was lights up on stage and the band's just kind of milling about it. Did they, did they walk off stage? The band walked into the, into the wings. They, they dimmed the stage, but lights were, it was still mostly just, like stage lights. They did not turn on the house lights. Right. So it was just this weird vibe of nothingness. And even, I mean, these people, whatever was going on, I couldn't tell you what was happening. I mean, I assume somebody passed out and they had to, you know, get them help. Uh, and they finally did extract them from the pit, which was an interesting thing, even getting security to them, you know, in, in just a sea of people, but they, they finally got somebody out. They finally got him out. And Luke came back and took the stage and he said, uh, all right, we're good to go. We're going to start that song over. And uh, and he said, but folks, I do have one piece of advice. Drink a water every now and then. And that was a smart, but, you know, it was clearly not the yeah. first time he had said that, but it was the right way to sort of acknowledge what had happened and yet still return us to the party that he was throwing for the rest of the night. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it was that, that one phrase was like, oh man, that's like, I'm going to keep that in my back pocket. <laughs> like if I ever yeah. need it because it refocused, he's a, pro. he's a pro. Absolutely. Later in the night, maybe, I don't know, 40 minutes later, I saw him do something. The way the stage was set up was uh, they had, uh, 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 I, I don't want to call it a catwalk cause that's not the right term. Maybe it is the right term. They had a runway that came out from the, you know, in the, the middle of the stage, our, our vantage point was kind of right off the edge of that runway, the tip of that runway, which is where he'd spent most of the night. But, uh, he went at one point down, uh, to the, the stage, right. Where he had really never been like his guitar player was over there. And he sang the first half of the first verse of, of whatever song it was he was singing, looking at the people there. And then it was obvious to me he was not singing to them. He was checking out a situation, another one. And he motioned to one of his uh, road crew to go and, like, make sure that that also wasn't going to be a problem. And it, it never was. But it was interesting to see him. And he never he didn't skip a word, didn't skip a beat. It was just a very subtle thing. And throughout the tune, he kind of kept looking back at that, uh, you know, at that spot to make sure his his road crew wasn't telling him you got to stop the show again. Um, but it was it was just fascinating watching watching it all sort of transpire. I, I love this stuff about you know uh, watching performances happen because you know there's there's all kinds of things. But he kept the party going. It was it was fascinating, really really um, impressive to uh, to see. I mean, he's a pro, so yeah. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Did you play any gig? I didn't play any gigs this weekend. Did you play any gigs this weekend? I did. I played last week. I played a solo gig on Thursday, which was just nice. You know, it it, it is continues to be. I mean, it's all so, soul soothing, right? Yeah. Sometimes in those solo gigs, you know, I'm playing only what I want to play at whatever pace, whatever tempo, you know, whatever vibe, and and I it, there's a sense of control of the mood that I have control over all levers that is really rewarding. And so, so Thursday was a really nice one. Friday though, was a kind of an interesting one. You know, I'm, I'm the always be performing guy, right? Right. So Friday we played a venue, outdoor venue close to the ocean mellow. It, it, it was a five to seven gig, nice evening, a little cool. Um, the whole venue was kind of fire pits and lawn chairs, nice. you know, and it was, I played with my true. Yeah, it is a really nice place. And, um, uh, something on my Bose sound system was having a problem. Actually, the, one of, the, of all the things, it was the cable, right? The cable that connects the mixer yep. to the actual sound system. And so twice, all of a sudden you get this fizzy sound and then the, the sound is gone. We're like, oh, crap. And we figured out it was the cable. And uh, my drummer, good guy, you know, he's like, oh, you know, here's a couple ways we can jury. We didn't have a replacement cable. Like Dave always has three of everything. Always got to have but, it. Um, yeah. Yep. Anyway. That happened at the top of the gig. 
And it was just kind of a mellow night, right? And I kind of felt myself very keenly in the moment aware, like, oh, I'm really disappointed that that sound system. I was disappointed because our first time playing this place, I'd play there. First time the trio had played there. Yeah. People were people seemed to be, you know, they were applauding and tipping, and it was it was okay, but it just kind of felt like it wasn't what it could have been. And I felt myself fighting the temptation to kind of be like, oh, it's one of those nights, you know, and you know, let the kind of disappointment carry my mood uh, and, and reminding myself always me performing and, you know, trying to summons the, you know, the, the kind of the chemistry was taking me in one direction and my brain, you know, my, my intellect was taking me in another direction. Does that right. make sense? It totally does. Yeah. 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 The vibe of the night was mellower than, than you knew it should be or wanted it to yeah. be. Yeah. 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 And then with te technical problems and actually coincidentally, the bass player who never has technical problems, he was having a cable problem. So we were, wow. it was just uh, in my mind, it was like, Oh, I guess it's going to be one of those nights. It wasn't like I was pissed. I wasn't going to smash anything. <laughs> no, I but, get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like I said, chemistry was starting to be like, Oh, you know, it's not going to be a, you know, big happy night. Let's just, but my brain is saying, I'm the always be performing guy, you know, do it. And, and actually my drummer, he noticed. He's like, "You okay?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." You know, we're just fighting through, and that, that's literally what I was doing—fighting through. Yeah. Like I said, gravity was pulling me down. You know, me, me with a conscious understanding of what my job is was trying to lift myself back up, and I was somewhere in the middle. I wasn't like, you know, as on on mic, and I, you know, and and you know, I think those who knew me would know I was, you know, if I'm usually an eight, I was probably a six. You yeah. know, in terms of. It, energy and mood. energy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally get that. And I, I mean, I think we've all been there. Um, and sometimes you give into it and just say, okay, well, it's going to be, you know, if the rooms, in, the problem is if the rooms, if you're normally at an eight and the rooms at a six or a five, it's really easy to settle at a four. Right. And yeah. like, that's the, that's the, the hard part about it is like, well, I can't be what I want to be. And so I'm just not going to even try. You know, well, but in my brain, I always want to be the guy who can take it from a four to an eight, right? Or ten, or right? Whatever. And 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 uh, that internal monologue you have about about what you can do, and do you, you know, are you feeling it, and where can you go, and you know, and then in the side of your mind is like. But is the PA going to crap out again? Is my bass player's cable okay? You know? <laughs> yeah. so, so you know, I, this I, is the life, right? Absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. So, I when it's relatively speaking, it's easy to either keep the energy up or bring the energy up. If you're just naturally feeling it for whatever reason, maybe you had a great day. Maybe you do have a good crowd, you know, whatever it is, you can bring that and just let that fuel you. But how do you do it when you don't have the fuel, right? When there's, when you're showing up and it's like, you know, either you show up and you're sort of low energy or you wind up with, you know, technical glitches or, or what have you situational surprises that leave you a little distracted. Do you have like your bag of tricks of, all right, well, here's the thing I say before this song, even though I don't really mean it tonight, I'm just going to say it anyway and see if we can like get the spark going. Do you, do you have those? I'd say my bag, of, my bag of tricks is more a song selection choice. Okay. Right. It's more like, change course and, you know, pull out a higher energy song earlier than you might have sure. and see if you can get things going. So it's not so much a, you know, a, 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 a like an on mic. A banter thing. You know, yeah, it's not a banter thing. It's more like a repertoire thing. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You got to have, you got to have something that you can rely on to give you that spark if, if you need it for sure. Yeah, that's tough, man. I'm sorry you had to had to deal with it. I mean, I know we all have, but you know, it, it, we all have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, you know, it, just saying it out loud, and if it helps any one person, whoever, if you're conscious enough to feel yourself sliding, that's part of the battle, right? If you know, if you, oh yeah, if, if you can, if you can be just present in the moment enough to realize, hey, you know, I, I, I'm here to do a job. You know, and, you know, this job is pretty cool in that it can make people happy. I'm going to be conscious that some of these other things that are going on, we're going to make the best of it. And we're going to find some way, whether it's making some self-effacing comment or, you know, yeah. if you're good at that, whatever it is. Yeah, whatever you know, your, tell, whatever. Tell people to drink for. water, whatever it might be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was interesting seeing how much charisma can be loaded into the phrase, 
Every now and then, folks, maybe just drink a water, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. But it, I mean, it worked. It did. It refocused the entire crowd. And part of the reason is what we were saying last week. The crowd wants to be refocused, right? People are there, whether you're Paul Kent or Luke Bryan, it doesn't matter. People come to be entertained, right? They didn't show up hoping for you to fail. If, if they if they had any indication you might fail, they would have stayed home or gone somewhere else. Right. So it like that is one of those things that we all need to remind ourselves of in those moments when we see this, you know, to, at some degree, a disaster sort of unfolding around us. Right. Like this is non optimal. The PA is glitching out. The bass players things glitching out. It's, uh, you know, I'm feeling low energy. It's. No one is there in hopes that you fail, right? They are all there for you to succeed. And and so you can leverage at the very least, you can leverage that. So, yep. hey, there's something I started thinking about uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, you know, on this show, you often say everybody needs a bill and who you're talking about, of course, is uh, or for not, of course, for those people who don't know, is Bill Tasto, who is. Uh, a a member of the House Rockers family, I would argue and say he's a member of the House Rockers band, although he doesn't play an instrument with the band. He is your sound engineer. He is your, uh, you know, logistical manager at the gigs. Right. Is that yeah. is that a fair? OK, so. Yeah. And, and actually, to clarify, he, we consider him a member of the band. He gets an yeah. equal cut. He right. is. He's he's a member of the band. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so um, you say everybody needs a bill and. I, when when you've said it, I've I've known at least a lot of the history of of where, you know, where Bill came from and, and all of this stuff. So I always know what you mean when you say this, but our listeners might not. And, and the part I really wanted to kind of shine a light on is that you don't necessarily like this might not be as difficult as you folks think. Because correct me if I'm wrong, when Bill came in, he didn't have uh, any or or much in the way of of training in terms of sound or anything like it was mostly a learned because he was there involved with the house rockers since the beginning kind of thing. Right. Uh, yeah, it's really true. So you remember you and I have this friend, Bob Levitas, who used to tell us stories that he grew up in the same neighborhood as the Jackson five and he became really good friends with one of them. Yeah. And and really good friends. And this one member of the Jackson five found Bob a, uh, a, a gig running lights at Jackson five shows. In the well, 70s, he became right? Jermaine's guitar tech. That's right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, you know, the concept of having someone who you trust being around your band uh, is the essence of everybody should have a bill. So yeah. yes, Bill is our sound guy and, but you can get a sound guy yes. or you can run a sound for yourself. But the value of having someone around your band who does stuff like does the calling ahead when sound is provided and, you know, walks people through your list or, you know, or just cares about the band enough. And again, Bill is Bill runs sound. Bill. But, Bill, but in, the House Rockers out. is the first band that Bill ever did sound for. Right. Like yep, it, it, yep. he he learned how to do sound on the job with with you guys. I, and, and, he I, did, and he did it as a favorite. I mean, not because he was it. so interested in learning sound. He right. was my friend. And uh, and I said, hey, I need some help. And I probably needed help more with the loadout or load in and load out. <laughs> it, was more, it was probably more a mule situation at the time. And, you know, then we kind of put him in front of stuff and got it. Sound set up so it wasn't feeding back, and just kind of gave him. Yeah, tell him to run him, faders you know, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and and then you know we did have like a couple pro sound guys look over his shoulder, give him some tips, and he took it on himself to learn. And you know he's a guy who didn't play an instrument, but wanted to be in a band, and that's I think that's your point. There are people like that out there, whether they're in your circle of friends. There's a lot of people out there if they have the time, love music, love you. Yeah, and you know might be a good choice to do some of the things that can free you up in whatever way you need to be freed up. I mean, you may That's like it. doing the logistic stuff, but I, I it, it's interesting. I don't know a lot of people who have a bill. And again, our bill, you know, happens to be now a really good sound system, like he's sought after by other bands and, sure. you know, all these types of things, but he's, he's a band member. I mean, and, and it was interesting because he actually came to me many years ago and said, listen, you know, I'll, I'm going to do this, but I gotta be a band member. I mean, I, I get a, I get a vote. I get a, 
I get equal pay and all this type of stuff. And so even on gigs where we don't provide sound, he'll get an equal pay. And, you know, he's, he'll, he'll help us load in. Sure. He'll interface. Yeah, like he still does work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. A lot of work. And it, and it balances out, you know, when on days when we do sound, he does, you know, two to three hours before and one to two hours afterwards, you know, yeah. is, is his work day. You know, he doesn't come to, he doesn't come to rehearsals. Um, we, every once in a while I'll jump in just so we can see him. But sure. um, the concept of having a trusted extra soul as part of your band. That's it. If your money can go that far, you know, most bands I know would willingly chip in one, anything from one tenth to one twenty fifth of their pay yeah. to have a guy help with load in or load out. Right. Oh yeah. No. And that's the part I wanted to point out is it's, it, you know, Bill does all these things for you now, but it's been many decades, right? It started out as, as a trusted friend that would be there to help with whatever you needed help with. And, and I, I think we, we need to keep, that's the part that I want people to keep in mind as you're, as you're starting your band, or even if your band is up and running, you will find those people that sort of become circling in your orbit. And a few of them will become the people that you can trust. You know, not all of them. you got to really pick carefully. I've seen bands implode from the inside when you bring the wrong people into the kind of inner circle. But bringing someone in like that that can really help take the the headaches off your, your plate at gigs and, and elsewhere, you know, again, like you said, whatever it is you need, finding people that can start to kind of fill those holes for you, that can make a huge difference in terms of how successful your band is, how enjoyable your band is. And so I just, I wanted everybody to understand what I understood every time you said <laughs> everybody needs a bill. Cause it hit me. It was like, I think I might be the only one that knows what he's talking about. And I, and people are missing out. So I wanted to, sort of shine a light there because now he, he's a gem of a human being and he's a good friend and he's a confidant to everyone in the band. Yeah. And he sometimes provides that non, you know, he's, he's enough removed from some of the musical decisions that his input on things can give a different type of clarity because he's close to it, Yeah, but he's not, he's not in it. He doesn't right? have a, he doesn't have a dog in the fight. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, he's set me straight on, you know, some personnel things many times. Sure. I just, he knows, he knows what we do. He has a great sense for why we've been pretty successful and he cares about it. I mean, he's, he's a, he's a, a keeper of the flame. He's a caretaker of the band's mission. Interesting. That's, that's huge, man. That's huge. Uh, it is huge. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And that's why when I say, I wish that for everybody and you're right, you're, it's probably, you probably just never thought about it. Like, you know, we're a band, it's, you know, people play instruments, but the concept of having, some people have a manager, you know, at, at all yeah. levels, you know, I hear about managers and that type of things. Uh, and, but, but sometimes that's purely a financial relationship and so many bands have a sound guy and, you know, maybe you are experiencing to some degree this level, but having that kind of trusted friend who does work, but also, like I said, is a, a care caretaker of your mission is really useful. It's, just, it's been amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for trusting me to have this conversation. Cause I, I, I no. think people, I think people will, I, I, I hope is that listeners will say, wait a minute, what about Roger? Like he would be, he's that guy for us. We should, you know, make this official and put a ring on him. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> love that. I love that. Yeah. Hey, um, Listener Eric had, uh, he wrote us here at feedback at giggabpodcast.com and he says, Paul, a few episodes back, you talked about being the one in your band that pushes the most and how you were going to let it go and just enjoy the ride. He, he has some questions. He says, uh, are you still able to do that? And if so, how's it going? And if not, why not? He says, I ask because I'm in a similar position where I'm the guy in the band that pushes the most. And it has taken me right up to the line of sucking the fun out of it for me and probably a few of the others. Um, and, and then he had some other nice things to say about us here too. So uh, mm -hmm. how is that going for you, Paul? <laughs> oh, it's horrible. I failed miserably. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just not that guy. I'm just yeah. not that guy. An idea comes, but you get this cause you're not that guy either. I mean, so I mean, you may have a me. different capacity. It's hard for me to be Dave bang drum. 
like I, I, I have to remind myself of that. And it doesn't like it, it works like when I was doing a, a bunch of theater gigs or whatever that that was sort of the place where I had to really compartmentalize that. It was like, OK, this is like I'm showing up. I in, am enjoying the music I'm playing. I'm enjoying the musicians that I'm playing with Dave Bang Drum. I can't worry about the the headaches and the mania that's kind of going on around me. Um, and I and there have been bands with whom I have had short stints where I can I can you know, play the Dave bang drum roll, but in any band where I'm actually in the band and care about it, there's no freaking way I can be just Dave bang drum. Like I care too much and I want to, I have ideas, but I have learned that it's important to let all ideas out and, and that just because I'm passionate about mine doesn't mean that mine are the best. Right. And so like there's there's that that I've learned. But, yeah, it's hard to be just a bang drum. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's good for people who are wired like that to give themselves a break on occasion. Mm -hmm. Like, like realize that you're not that guy. And for some period of time, just not give a crap, you know, for a it's going to you don't have a choice. You're not going to be that guy. You're not going to be the don't give a crap guy for very long. No. Right. No, you can't. But yeah, I think when when. You know, whatever it is, the things that are causing you grief, whether it's personalities or lack of gigs or lack of good gigs, whatever that thing is that you really want to control, know who you are. You know, if you're that guy who's, you know, ideas come in your head and you have to act on them, it's, it's gotten you where you are. Of course. Likely. Yes. Right? Likely. It, it, is, sure. it is your superpower. Right. And you got to embrace it, but you also got to be kind of gentle on yourself and give yourself a break every once in a while. So. You know, for Eric, if he said he's gotten to the point where it drains the fun out of it, you know, I would measure that, you know, is the fun all the way out of it and you're really not having any fun? Well, then then make a change. But yeah. it's going to be not fun. It's not fun for all of us at some point in time. Yeah. Whether it's at a rehearsal or a bad gig or, you know, a, a guy start, starts bringing a significant other and we all agreed not to bring significant other, whatever it might be, it's going to be not fun at times. I was going to call that the Yoko what? syndrome, but really we've learned that Yoko wasn't the problem. So we will, we will leverage spinal tap and call that the Janine syndrome. So there, there you go. go. Yeah. Yeah. But I think just, if you can kind of like the previous discussion, if you can be in the moment to be aware that, Oh, this is one of those troughs of life. <laughs> there that's that's going to be followed by a peak you know because yep. it always is yep and you know not not let the troughs dominate your headspace i think is a is not a bad way to live but if you are the guy who's wired and you're the one who stepped up and said i'll i'll do the i'll do the booking or i'll get us the rehearsal space or i'll get us the bus or whatever it's going to be if you're that guy who's a doer and you're an organizer and you're a facilitator and you're a cat herder that's your superpower, man. You gotta, you gotta love yourself for that. And yep. then when it's disappointing, when people don't quite get the stress and pressure and effort that goes into being that guy, you just got to kind of shake your head and be like, you know, people can be insensitive sometimes, or, you know, situations can be dark sometimes, but a trough is always followed by, you know, it's always darkest for the dawn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's the lesson of all, all good things don't last and all bad things don't last. It's just, how That's it right. is, you know, it's hard to remember that in the moment uh, with it both sure of them. Is. Yeah. So you can think, oh, things are going great. It's just going to be like this forever. Well, I got news for you. <laughs> it's probably not, you know, but also when things are going to crap, well, guess what? It's also not going to be like that forever. So, you know, right. Yep. That's how it is. I mean, I come to, I come into X percentage of these recordings ready to blast everybody I know. And I, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's those five minutes before we actually hit record, you know, with you and me talking, where I'm yeah. like, all right, this isn't going to serve any purpose in my life. Let's just, let's just put it in the shelf, put it, in, you know, put it away and yeah. you know, we'll be fine. I had a, um, a thing that I've had kind of on the list for a little bit and talking about how Luke Bryan engra engaged the crowd and talking about how, how you were engaging or not engaging the crowd. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to run through this. It was a, a post I saw in the cover band central group from a woman named Grace who was uh, talking about how to teach someone how to engage with the crowd. And it was fascinating. She, she listed like, I don't know, five or six things 
that I'll, I'll read through and, and feel free to stop me or, or we can talk about it at the end or, or whatever. But I just wanted to read some of her things because a lot of these, uh, you, if you, if you are someone who does this, you might say, oh, actually, I, I already like I do that. And maybe I didn't know it or, you know, the, that sort of thing. And if, if or maybe there's some things in here where you go, oh, that's actually not a bad idea. So uh, number one, she says, talk in a slightly high enough pitch so that people can hear your words over the rumble of crowd noise, which is, you know, as I always think of it, project. When you're talking to people, you need to project as loudly as you were singing to them because that's what they're used to hearing, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Um Talk slowly enough and enunciate so that people can understand your words. Okay. Don't rely on making it up as you go. You can't be clever or funny on command every moment of the show. Have things that you say almost identically every night. And she says, uh, I have a number of things I say with very little variation that consist of most of my communication from the stage. I have a little blurb telling them name of the band and the city we hail from. I introduced the band members just before and after their first two songs, because in, in that band, each band member sings uh, a bunch of songs in the show. Uh, the remainder is just a reminder of who is uh, going to or who just sang the song. She says after the first eight songs or so, I quit doing that as people already know who we are by that point. Uh, mm-hmm. It's, it, you know, fascinating stuff. She says, uh, I run each team drink. I like the idea of calling it a team drink when you're getting the crowd to, to drink. Says I run almost uh, each tr- team drink almost identically. Remember, people get drunk and dumber as the night goes on. If you can capture their attention with a team drink early in the evening, you can use this as a recurring moment throughout the night. Think drunk mm. football fans that know all of the cheers. And I, this was the part that made me add this to the show. It's like, right. You know, they can't have a cohesive conversation with each other, but they can yell big G, little O, go, 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 or defense, defense, right? <laughs> and they never misspell or misspeak until, of course, she says they pass out. So if you can turn your t- team drink into a familiar cheer, you can't go wrong with it all night long. I, and I, that one is the one that jumped out at me. There's a couple others uh, that, I, that, I'll, that I'll go through here, but that idea of coming up with a consistent cheer um, and treating it that way, especially for, you know, club gigs where the, the focus is on selling booze to people, it makes a lot of sense, man. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if you're, yeah. it, no, I totally get it. I mean, that would be, if you accept what your role is when you're a bar band, Yes. Right. You know, if you get that, this is the path to success and embrace it, it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, yeah. I mean, if, you, uh, what did we used to do? Oh, we used to make sure that there was, when we would play Margaritaville, that there was a Margarita special. Oh, smart. Announce it, you know. Yep. They don't need to dance to Margaritaville. They can sing from wherever they are, including at the bar. And, the, the bar, so you know, you could do that with one bourbon, one shot. Would be, I mean, there's a lot of songs. Every country song talks about whiskey, right? That's right. Oh no, yeah, there's right, yeah, there's there's plenty of them out there. That's right. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, she's, yeah so I I think it's great great advice, and it's just about knowing what your real job is, opposed to what you think your job is. That's it. And, 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 and that often seems to be what the problem is, and in so many of these conversations, you know, you think your job is to be a rock star. It, well, and even if your job is a rock star, when you're, you know, the, 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 when you're on stage, your job is to engage the crowd. When you're off stage, if you happen to be a rock star, that's when you can actually do rock star things, you know, like passing out in an alleyway, if that's, you know, your, your brand of a rock star, whatever. Right. But when you're on stage, your job is to engage and entertain. And you got to keep that going. One of the things she says is, you know, ultimately the front person's job is to keep the attention of the audience while the other band members prepare for the next song. That means that you yourself might not get much time to repair for the next song. So you have to have your stuff together. Ultimately, dead air is death to a cover band. If you can't hold their attention, the crowd will get bored and disconnect from your performance. And uh, you know, I, I don't disagree. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I actually am going to disagree a little right. bit. Yeah. Lots of, like, I don't know what this preparing for the next song is. I, I don't, I don't really get that concept. Sure. I mean, I mean, flow from one to the other should be part of your, your deal, right? You're part of the but, show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Again, to, I always think with, like with my band, 10 pieces, the absence of sound space is at a premium. 
Sometimes a big song with a big ending, we will cut it off. I don't always have control of the lights, so I can't also hit the lights at the same time. Sure. But 20 seconds of, you know, just nothing. Yeah. Isn't bad. No, that, and then when that's, you come, when, you're right. When that you come be- back from that 20 seconds, it can, you know, depending on what you come back with and you either build the energy or you can recap. So I, I, but, but I would much have nothing than inane chatter that is clearly wasting time or buying time or, or, or useless. I mean, I, that just seems amateurish to me. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, that's why, you know, her, one of her first points was, uh, you know, I have a number of things I say with very little variation. So, you know, not going off the rails, just have the bit that, you know, works, share the bit, play the next song. And maybe, maybe you need to buy time for somebody to change from a, you know, a, a standard tuning guitar to an open G guitar or something for a couple of tunes or, you know, whatever that might be, have that in the set, know that you've got to do your little shtick. And some people are gifted. I don't want to say, well, some people are gifted. Some people have honed their craft and truly can ad lib and be entertaining all night long. Uh, mm-hmm. it, that is not most people. Some people can be, you know, and, and that's fine. Um, but know who you are and fall and create some rules that give you the best chance at success consistently. Not, you're not looking for, you know, well, you know, yeah, the last four gigs were eh, iffy, but man, five gigs ago I was on and that was amazing. Yeah. Well, that doesn't, you know, that's not going to get it done for you. You know, better yeah. to, better to, better to bat doubles and singles than try and hit home runs and, and strike out. Right. So for the sports reference, because we have to have yeah. one, I guess, I don't know. Um, the one, the one thing that I will, that I will pull out of this, she says, at the end of a set or the end of the night, I say the same thing. It's informative. It lets the fans know if we're coming back or if the show is over. And for people who've seen us a number of times, it makes sense to them, even if they aren't listening closely. They just know what's going on. Right. I think that's really smart. Just having having consistency in in the in in the sharing of information, I think, is is huge. So and yeah. anyone should be able to do that. I, the problem is yes, when absolutely. you, you decide that, that just being yourself and, and just doing your housekeeping is not good enough. And you try to inject it with some, yeah. again, I don't want to say artificial because if someone is good at artificial, you know, it's, they're not whatever it is talking in an accent, you know, right, right, right. Being, being self deprecating There's, there's, I think there's a certain, the, the, the essence is truth. Truth can mean that you're really good at acting a part. That is a truth, right? Sure. Yeah. Truth can truth can mean you're not, and so you're just going to call a spade a spade, and you're gonna you're just gonna you know be you, right? That yep. that's a truth also. It's it's um, it's it's when things come off as disingenuous that it falls apart at all levels. Like the audience doesn't like it. You feel self conscious about it. Hopefully, um, if you're aware. Um, you know, so it's always the question, what is the truth? What is, when you play your music, what is the truth? When you entertain, what is the truth? Well, again, I think, truth that- I think it's more than that because it, you can, you can be truthful to who you are and still terrible at engaging a crowd, or you can be truthful to who you are and just acknowledge that, well, the best thing for me to do is to literally have a script and deliver the same script. It's my script. It's truthful. But I'm not trying to come up with it on the spot every night. I'm, I know that I'm not good at that. So I'm going to yeah. have a script and it's my words. It's my stuff. It's my truth, but it is my script and I yeah. know it and I can say it every night. And it's a great way to, you know, like we were talking about before to get the spark going. Awesome. You know, like we, we play, um, and I will say that Billy Butler is, is one of the best improvisers I've ever seen there. There have been nights where he has literally improvised the entire verse of a song. There was one, one show we were playing recently. What the heck was it? Oh, we were, um, we're playing this festival that we had hosted and this tent kept falling over. That was like covering these people who were doing face painting or whatever. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the verses for one of our songs, this, this song called Tom waits for none was just Billy improvising, uh, you know, a, like 
a a a rap about this this tent and 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 all of this stuff and it was brilliant it was great that said that doesn't happen most of the time most of the stuff that he says is stuff that he has written including we we often start the set with this song whiskey oxy and a couple of perks and uh and 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 he starts it usually by asking anybody here on drugs you know the band's kind of vamping along and it engages the crowd but the things he says after that are generally verbatim from night to night. Every now and then he might throw in something topical for the venue or whatever. But generally speaking, he's just kind of, you know, we're getting the show started. There's no reason to go off the rails yet. Uh, we're still trying to hook people and, and entertain. And, you know, we don't have them necessarily in the palms of our hands. We don't want to go nuts yet. So he just, you know, he just rolls with it. And it works out great because it's we we he knows that it's going to be entertaining because it's entertained many other times. It's engaged many other times. And there's nothing That's wrong why scripts with that. Exist. They work. That's why scripts exist. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, exactly. The, the process has been has been rigged. Yeah, it's right. I, you know, yeah. I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, there was an interesting Facebook thread and it's fun, funny when we pull out threads from other, other, other cover band discussions or other sure. musicians, because, it, because it gives a, a lens into Facebook, which we have to remind ourselves is not necessarily the real world. Right. Everybody's brave. You know, everybody's brave behind the keyboard. Keyboard right? warriors, you, man. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the premise of this was really kind of interesting because as I was before, saying you know musicians um they they can be suspect business people right so the premise of this thread was that uh there's a venue that doesn't pay well there's a little bit of mythology as to whether they paid better once upon a time but in net net the premise was they don't pay well okay which led to a long thread of how dare they not pay well, right and you know calls for yes musicians Musicians should boycott and, and really, you know, get some of the power back. And, you know, then it trailed off into other venues that might or might not pay well and what musicians should do and, you know, how certain musicians feel about other musicians who who play at a place that doesn't pay well. And it was, just, you know, it was 120 comments long of an optic into the concept that, you know, pay pay rates – have not even come close to commensurate with what many other things. I don't know how long since the minimum wage has been has been lifted, but you know I think it's pretty accurate that the 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 going rate was somewhere around a hundred bucks a man in the seventies, so fifty yeah. years ago. Sure, and that's kind of where you start now. It, it is somewhat the, lunatic, but the drinking however, the drinking age was also different. Uh, the drinking mm -hmm. age was eighteen back then, and it yeah, is but also wages now. have gone up way more. Yeah, fair. Right? So yeah, you yeah. know. But, you know, my thought of reading this whole thing was like, A, um, you don't have to play there. It's right. not the only gig. <laughs> yeah. You want this gig because they're making money or because they have a crowd or, you know, whatever your reason is that you want this to be a better gig. Sure. But, you know, really, it's not likely as long as someone has taken the gig and the reality. And again, I'm, I'm sensitive to this because I had to learn this lesson over time to you know, the reality of the market is reality of any market is someone will pay the least amount that they can afford to pay for a service. That's, that's what they'll do. And if, and if they can't, if they want to offer the service and they can't get anyone to do it, that's when that's just the way economics works. Right. That's how if, it is. If, yeah. That's just, that's a reality. But so if you, if you don't the, want to, uh, to your point, if you don't want to play for a hundred bucks a man, don't like it. It's that simple. Don't right. charge right. more. You'll either get it or you won't. That's a whole other scenario. But if you don't want to play for a hundred bucks a man, don't. Right. And I think that that's the, that's where it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. This venue, this venue is not what you want it to be as much as you hope for, as much as you want to threaten them, as much as you want to bully them. None of that is probably going to work. I don't know. If there's any history of musicians <laughs> banding together to get you know some venue to play to pay better, right? Right. Right. You know, the, it, you take care of your. It, actually, there are better paying gigs out there. It's not that venue, but in any market, 
There are X amount of venues that are cool places to play where they love music and they love musicians and they pay better. And there's other places that will, it's in every market that where they'll, they'll plead poverty, even if they're not poor, all these types of things. And again, it, it, it foundationally is it stinks, but the reality is you do have people who will take gigs for nothing without kind of an ethical perspective into it is that, you know, the guy who needs the money, who is a full-time professional trying to make a living, you know, this, this creates downward pressure. Yeah. What do you do about that? You can educate those types of people and they can choose to, everybody has a choice in all this stuff. Someone, someone's willing to basically be, I don't know, call them a scab. I mean, someone's willing to say, Hey, I'll do it for free. Well, in any other profession, you know, you would probably be looked down upon by the people who that's their living, you know, and the people who do it professionally will state the case why it's a value to you to have someone who does it professionally. And if you're that good, you don't have to do it for free. I mean, there's all these there's all these arguments that you can make on all these types of things. But what I'm I'm trying to say is a market exists because of dynamics that, you know, literally, here's how much I'll pay. Will someone take it? Yes, no, the price goes up or down. Yeah, do I get the product that I want for the price that I want to pay? That's right. And yeah, but I, I think in, threatening bullying in order to Yeah, as I as I've said in in uh, you know on our our business brain show that I you don't want to get into a scenario where you are competing on price alone. And if that's where you find yourself as a musician, what's that what's that? It's uh -oh. just a bad strategy. It's just a bad strategy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, yeah, I like just, just don't, if, if, if you're finding that it bothers you and it's not getting you where you want to be, then just don't do that anymore. I will say from my own personal journey, I raised my prices. I'll say no to some stuff. I'll say some yes to some stuff if I like, of course, if I like the place or, you know, but but I know that, that once I committed to saying, you know, the forces of the universe gravitate you towards the situations that will meet your needs. Yes. I mean, there's, there's a, a karmic rule that, that's in play there. But, but wishing for a certain place, because it's cool, it's beautiful, cool people are there, whatever it is, I just, you know, you, that's a fool's errand, man. That's just, you're not going to, you're not going to wish and a venue into behaving differently than they have to until they have a reason to do it until, you know, they want to offer music. And, you know, I have a friend who made the point that like, well, you know, I know these venues and they're small businesses and they like music, but there's a point at which it's just not worth it to them. And I was like, how do you, the musician know what that point is? Right. Like, so when they're really crowded and they have a really good night, does that mean they should pay more? And do they pay more? And so, you know, there's a lot to discern about this, you know, m mobile pricing concept. But I don't know. I think I think hey, I think Bruce musician, Springsteen has some has some ooh, people asking oh, about baby. pricing. <laughs> I, I was wondering when you were going to go there. Um, <laughs> but anyway, my point is, you know, if you sense that someone is not being straight with you about pricing, they're probably it's not a place you want to play as much as you like the place or like seeing yourself there or, or or if it's good for your career in one way or another, or if $60 on a Wednesday night is better than zero, whatever your ethics say. Wait, what, yeah, exactly. Yeah. As long as as long as you are a conscientious uh, contributor to the music community as a whole, trying to make things better. You know, again, if you're if you're someone who competes on price in any industry, if you are the low leader, you've got other types of business problems. And, you you know, yep. what are you going to do? Make it up in volume. There's only seven days in a week. Yeah, yeah, you, you, know, yeah, you, yeah. Scaling a, a, a band is not generally something that works out. Right. So uh, unless it's like that band you saw, the uh, I want to call them the nerds, but that's not the. Band. Oh, the spasmatics. The spasmatics, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. that's a that's become a franchise, so it has actually scaled a little bit. But um, right for the guy who owns the franchise, for the one who guy, owns the master. that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know, so for the people who want the keyboard warriors who want to go and you know complain and wish that a venue could be different, right? And and you're doing it on Facebook. That's not the place to do it. 
I, I get that if you just want to vent, great. You know, Facebook's perfect for that. You get all kinds of people to either agree with you or argue with you, and it's amazing. But if you want to affect real change in this scenario, talk to the venue. You yeah. know, if if they're re- if you really feel like they are missing this bigger picture, have that conversation with them. Now, I, I wouldn't necessarily well, try, try this for sale. Try, try this on for sale. Yeah. So this particular venue pays, I think, four hundred bucks. Okay. Regardless of the size of the band, four hundred. Sure. Bucks. Yep. If you would go to this venue and say, "Well, listen, I like your venue, and you know it's, it's an interesting place to play, but our rate is actually six hundred bucks, or whatever your number is. Our sure. rate is actually six hundred bucks." And um, so, let me ask you a question: If you do a little bit better than you usually do on a given night when we play, would you be open to meeting our our rate? You know, I'm willing to take a little chance on you if you're willing to take a little chance on me. Yeah. How everybody reacts in that moment tells you all you need to know. That's right. If the guy says, nope, that's all I'm going to pay, you have learned quite a bit about, is there like, you know, you know they're pleading answer. poverty. Well, if they're pleading poverty, you know, and and you're saying, but what about if it's a night where you're not poor? You know, maybe they'll say, well, other nights I am poor, so let's have to pay for those good nights. But but yeah. I'm like, but when I'm there, you're not poor, right? So it, it, I agree with you. The only way to do it, and again, at the end of the day, there's a leap of faith that happens. So yes. my friend who said, you know, I know these small venues that that's all that they can afford or, you know, or, or they wouldn't have music. I would be like, you know, but what if they do really well? I mean, what if, what if you change their business? What if, you know, what if you bring a bunch of people in? Is it, is, is this open for discussion? If not, they're kind of telling you what they value the music at. And then you get to decide what that means to you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is important to remember, you know, when we're at a venue and playing the most important thing, or at least the most obviously important thing to us is playing, right? Like that's what we're there to do. We are seeing it from our vantage point. We are not seeing it from the, you know, the bar owner's vantage point, who's looking at every aspect of it. And the music is just one piece of that. You know, there's there's music. Okay, that brings people in. Maybe. Or maybe it drives people out. I don't know, you know. But there's music. There's food. There's the, the you know, there's drinks at the bar, obviously. There might be some other things that go on. Like, you know, the, the pool tables make money on a certain night because of the way we do things. Like, I don't know. And that's the thing is you don't know until you just sit down and talk with them on an equal level. Don't come in too hot. You know, just... Ask them like it, the, the, the way you phrased it was perfect, Paul. You know, hey, is there is normally we charge more. I realize there's a gap. Is there something we can do where we share a little bit of the risk and share a little bit of the reward? Is there is there a middle ground here? And and that can be a wonderful path to a long term fruitful relationship. Or, as you said, it can tell you everything you need to know. Yeah, but the a concept of, that is some some menu is dying to pay you as much as they possibly can, that's just fallacious thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's not, that's generally not how, it, that, that's not a way for a venue to stay in business, usually, usually. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, anyway, take care of your business. That's it. Yeah, well, that's it is, is and don't be afraid to talk with people. Uh, you know, it, so many problems can be solved by just having a conversation. That's why you and I have this conversation every week, isn't it? I think we solve uh, each other's problems. We, that is what Ther- we do. An hour of therapy. Yeah, man, it is. It's musical therapy. It's just life therapy. It's not just musical therapy. This is <laughs> all right, folks. Do you have anything else for him today, Paul? I'm good, man. Yeah, same. Thanks for listening, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. And, uh, my good friend Paul Kent here, earlier in the episode, you said a thing. I can't remember. I'm always having trouble with this. What is that? I think it was always be performing. That was it. That's it. 